I want to welcome up to the stage two open source computing icons for a fireside chat on Web3, quantum, and the open source future. So please join me in welcoming Brian Bailendorf and Worley. Icons. Well, I guess you're a quantum icon, yeah, I mean, which means you might I mean, be an icon he's an or open not source an icon. I don't, I don't, I don't think I deserve that credit. <laughs> well, I really appreciate uh, the chance to to come up on stage and talk to my longtime friend uh, William Hurley, otherwise known as Whirly. Uh, uh, just a bit of background on me. I'm uh, Brian Bellendorf. I'm on the board of the Filecoin Foundation. Uh, I've really had a great time helping kind of shepherd this community and think about how do we give it like a real, real foundation, like a real basis for being able to grow and build a big community and <laughs> be legal in everything that we do. Uh, I'm also on the board of the EFF uh, and I work at the Linux Foundation. So basically, if you have a foundation, I'll join your board. It's just I'm a, I'm a slut like that. I'll go. I'll go work on a foundation. All right. Uh, and, and what brings you here, really? So uh, I'm an Austin entrepreneur. Uh, I'm currently working in quantum computing uh, and very interested in the whole Web3 space and watching it uh, for a lot of reasons. Brian and I have known each other a long time, and I tend to like to go to these things and learn as much as I can. But uh, my background's simple. I started at uh, Apple, ended up in research and development, went to IBM, started doing startups in 2010, sold the first one to Accenture, sold the spin out to Zynga, and then we sold the last one to Goldman Sachs. Uh, I didn't get the job on the management team very long because obviously I'm Goldman Sachs material. Uh, so split off to try to get them to do quantum computing, met with you in Colorado uh, at the Linux Foundation meeting and pitched on a Linux Foundation project that ended up turning into a startup. Yeah. So you know, one of the themes I think uh, that, that we want to talk about today is, you know, we're kind of in this middle of a, of a, of a crypto winter to some degree, uh, and we want to try to understand, like, um, I think everyone wants to figure out, are we, are we at this inflection point? And I think back to, like, when we first met, which was here in Austin in, was it 2006? Yeah. You, were put, you put together this thing called the iPhone Dev Camp, right? That's right. Can you talk a little bit about, like, why you did that and that moment in time? Because I think it's pretty relevant, actually, what yeah, we're doing here. Yeah, so... Um, before the iPhone came out, a good friend of mine, Raven Zachary, uh, had an idea, which is we should gather iPhone users and developers from around the world and hack away at apps on the iPhone. And you have to understand the context. This is when Apple had said, we'll make the apps. There'll be no app store. There'll be no external third-party apps. And one, we thought that sounded like bullshit. <laughs> OK. And two, we thought, well, that's not how ecosystems are built. That's how anything. So, the week after the iPhone was released, we got 400 enthusiasts, developers, you know, artists together in Adobe's offices in San Francisco, and we built 80 web applications for the iPhone. And that ended up being where O'Reilly came out with their iPhone books, and the, a lot of iPhone companies were started. Um, it, was a, it was a really big deal. Uh, but it was all about you know, going through my career, looking at what could be the next thing, and then looking for data, not drama, around that thing. So I tend to be very pragmatic and objective so that you know, I can kind of chart out what the next few years of my career look like. And the secret to my success has been being in these open communities. Like I have received everything I have from being a part of the communities and supporting them and not trying to be above them or whatever and just, just being a part of it. So it was a really interesting time with the iPhone and it led to a lot of great things. Yeah, no, I um, started a company in 99 that was kind of like GitHub, but three generations too early. Uh, uh, like, you know, uh, to be in 99, can, trying to convince companies to host their source code on a cloud server somewhere when no one knew what the cloud was, was uh, just too early, right? So timing is everything. And having that sense of like where things are heading is kind of everything. So, um, so now you're in the quantum space. Yep. You must have like some intuition that something that there's like a similar moment now with quantum technology. Because all I've ever heard is like, it's the technology of the future and yeah. always will be. Um, so, but, but I'm starting to hear some good things. So tell us more about what you're doing and so, why. Yeah. You know, my interest in quantum uh, came around 2013, 2014. I just like deep tech science stuff. And around 2016, when Goldman Sachs acquired us, it was obvious I didn't have a job there. And so I said, well, I'd like to work on this quantum stuff. And they didn't really want to. And that started me working with the Linux Foundation about trying to get something together. And in 2017, we got a bunch of people together. And it wasn't very communal. Uh, you know, everybody was like, you know, I'm going to own it. No, I'm going to own it. No, I'm going to own it. And so I said, well, I guess I got to start a company to, to fill this kind of niche in the market. But the re reason I picked quantum 
is because I always know what my next three companies will be, and I do a, about twice a year, I do a reevaluation, a restack rank of them. And it was gonna be biohacking or um, uh, quantum, uh, and I had a couple other things, and it really came down to those two, and I just got out of a regulated industry, and I did not enjoy the <laughs> compliance experience, so I was like, well, I'm gonna do the quantum thing. But it was also a matter of timing. Um, timing when you're starting something new comes down to a couple of factors. Um, the practical application of the technology, the uh, development of the community around the technology, and then what the external world looks at that technology as. When we started in 2018, if at the stroke of midnight, the day we launched a company, every quantum company went out of business, none of you would have ever been the wiser, right? <laughs> and so you have to like kind of time it. You, I believe like 2016, we did iPhone Dev Camp, didn't found Chaotic Moon until 2010, four years later. 20, you know, 14, 15, I really start getting into quantum still a few years later. So, you know, it, it's, it is kind of intuitive. It's hard to explain, but it's worked so far, but we're not out yet. Well, what, so what, so the company's called Strangeworks, right? Correct. Is it a hardware company? Is it no, like... So we're, so we're a software only company. So my goal is to give quantum to all of you. It's kind of like quantum to the people. And so we build a platform, you know, we built a community with um, Stack Overflow and started learning what people were having problems programming, what they didn't understand. Then we wrote a book called Quantum Computing for Babies, because uh, that's about my level of quantum understanding at that point. <laughs> and then we... Uh, it's like we, an actual children's book. Yeah, it's, an actual, it's actually the best-selling yeah. book in quantum now, which is sh at the, to the dismay of physicists worldwide. <laughs> um, but uh, we really wanted to have a project. You know, we sold our last company in one year. We launched it on March of 2015 at South By. I went and we did a pitch competition and then we got funding. And on March of 2016, I went on CNBC at South By and said, I work at Goldman Sachs on the management team, right? So it was a weird thing and it'll never happen again. And we wanted something that was gonna change the world. We wanted something that was going to drive uh, the future and help with environmental concerns I have and help with drug discovery fuck drug discovery, why don't we just eliminate the disease, right? Who cares about better battery chemistry? Why don't we find completely new forms of energy? And this is the technology that's gonna be able to do those kind of things. Right, help us with research, help us with Everything. all sorts of like, um, like other major issues. It's not just about uh, uh, smarter, better AI, but it's, but it's about applying that to the world. Yeah, and it's a, it's a complete, it's a first non-von Neumann architecture, and, and maybe we should talk about how it works for a second, because maybe, how many of you know anything about quantum computing or have heard of it? That is amazing. All four I think of if you. you're uncertain, <laughs> that's actually quantum computing as, 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 yeah, as yeah, an yeah. example, right? So, okay. so look, we, we borrowed a quarter from one of the, the stage uh, people here. So think of this quarter as your iPhone, as your iPad, your laptop, your PC, supercomputer, doesn't matter. Supercomputer, doesn't matter. All of them work the same way. If I set it heads down, heads up on the table, it's a one, tails up, it's a zero. On that two-dimensional plane, it can't be anything but those two. But if I take that same coin and I flip it in the air and I ask you, when it's at the apex of that spin, is it a one or is it a zero? And the answer is it's in a quantum superposition of some probability of a one or a zero. And just like a coin toss, until we stop it and observe it, we don't know what it is. And so while you can look at computers and see what it's doing to the data and everything, you don't know what's happening to that when you put that data into a quantum machine. So it's a really crazy stuff. There's a lot of very insane concepts like ghosting where you ask a computer a question, it gives you a different answer that's the right answer to the question you should have asked, which is mind blowing when you're a software engineer. <laughs> you're like, what? Yeah, I mean, a lot of different software yeah, development paradigms involved in this. And, and the, hardware, the hardware, sorry, has gone from a few qubits uh, at a time, yeah. to like hundreds now, right? Yeah, if you think about it, 1927 Solvoy Conference where Einstein and you know Heisenberg and everybody came up with quantum mechanics and it kind of solidified, it wasn't until 1980 that Feynman and Benioff came up with the idea of using an electron or atomic part as a spin. So you know where we use the coin as a classical computer, think of a quantum, a qubit, like a ball. And this is incredibly powerful beyond what you know. Uh, think about it this way, if you have four bits, you have 16 outcomes, and you can be in any one of those outcomes at one time. If you have four qubits, you have 16 outcomes, but you can be in all 16 simultaneously. So it's a complete game changer on compute power. Now there's a bunch of like noise that happens at the larger Absolutely. bits, and so you've got to have software to filter for that and that kind of thing. But 
is there some innovation? Uh, so as I understand it, the progress has been kind of incremental. It's been, you know, yep. uh, uh, the hardware is getting progressively better. Uh, and it starts to make sense given how noisy it is for AI uh, applications, which Absolutely. are probabilistic anyways. But when you think about a lot of the cryptography that the world relies on, and in particular the cryptocurrency community uh, and, and the Web3 community depend upon, you know, I think everyone's wondering, like, what's the timeline? And how much longer well, do we have? And uh, what's well, the risk that we wake up like on a Tuesday, yeah. and discover that you uh, have come up with a way to factor 2,000-bit elliptic curves or something like right. that. Right. So, like, so that's a great point. So, you yeah. know, talking about that timeline, so you get to the 80s, they think about it, in the early 2000s, MIT and others come up with like 12 qubits. These were n nuclear uh, resonance. Later, people were like, maybe that's not really quantum. But when we started in 2018, there were 17 qubits. Today, you can use machines in the... 100 to 5,000 range. Now the 5,000 are dealers and the 100 are superconducting and the thing you have to understand about qubits is when you're looking at this and how it might affect your industry, a qubit is not a qubit is not a qubit. Is it an ion trap suspended by lasers or a superconducting circuit where it's frozen down as cold as space? Each one of these things work differently and the qubits have different computational power, right? But the noise is our big enemy right now. We don't have error correction in the way that you do on a classical machine. And so you run the problem multiple times and you kind of average out to where the answer might be. But that's changing very fast. IBM's roadmap has them at 1,000 qubits plus in the next 24 months. And so to put it into perspective with your encryption uh, question. Low noise, 1,000 qubits. Yeah, that's okay. right. And so high fidelity, low noise, right? So when you look at that, you think, well, at about 4,900 qubits, I think it's likely RSA, as you know it, and other encryptions, they're, they're, they're useless. Now, let's put that in a realistic perspective. That's not the end of all crypto or anything. There used to be a machine called the Enigma machine, and nobody uses that anymore, right? Because security is kind yeah, of I a, it at the RSA conference. You can actually right. play with Se it's Security cool. is kind of a dance of threat and remediation. So, you know, quantum will be a bigger threat, and we'll remediate it with post-quantum cryptography. But if you had, like, you know, uh, which you do, you're really good at predicting the future, right? So if you could predict the future, on what day will somebody be able to wake up and come up with Satoshi Nakamoto's private key for, it, for, it, for it his, happens, his Bitcoin holdings? So I've thought about this a lot. It happens this decade. So it before, happens this decade. Before 2030. It happens probably in the later five years of the decade, the early part of the later five years. Yeah. So I would say like 26, 27, which if you think about it, especially because we're so old, that's not very far away. Right, right. Um, but the thing is, is that's okay, right? Because if I had a quantum computer and I could break everybody's key, I have to run it to break yours, I have to run it, and we don't know how long it would take. So we know that, a, you know, think about the, the traveling salesman as an example. We want to go to 14 cities around the world in the most optimized path, my laptop does that in a couple thousand seconds. We make it from 14 to 22, a difference of only eight. That same laptop takes three to 4,000 years. So what you're really talking about is this class of problems where the evaluation time soars, and that's where quantum's useful. So, you know, even if it did it, I can't tell you whether it breaks, you know, your key in a month or a day or an hour. I just know that with some reasonable amount of time, it's going to be broken, and then I have to go to every other key. Well, and I guess, I mean, even if the Bitcoin community were to adopt a quantum safe uh, uh, crypto routine, we can talk about that in a bit, but Satoshi's keys are still in the old form. So that's right. unless and that's somebody would update and like, his holdings for and a fork in some way. Yep, that's the danger Man. of quantum. The danger of quantum, if you think of it from a national security perspective, which is why governments have invested almost $30 billion in the last 10 years into this space, is that it's not about the secrets we have today, it's about secrets that were stolen or old keys and stuff that are past technologies that quantum's gonna slice like a hot knife through butter. So, so let's talk about quantum safe cryptography. Sure. I mean, I, I, I don't know how much you've looked at it, but like, is that, is that something real? I mean, we can keep adding bits to the lengths of keys, but um, uh, do we have to come up with new algorithms? Do they exist out there? I may stand on the wrong side of history on this one. Uh, my assumption, and it is an assumption, is that we will start developing computers in the quantum realm using quantum computing in the next 24 months. And so I think you go, you don't go to 1,000 qubits or 2,000 or 3,000, you go to 10,000 or 100,000 or a million or 2 million or 3 million. And at that point, 
the problem is with the way the math works is that if I break your key, um, it doesn't matter if you make the key longer. Once I know how to break it, there's a certain link you reach where, kind of like a point of diminishing returns, I'm going to break every key. So you make it as long as you want, it doesn't matter. You make it 10 million numbers but long. Are there, are there cryptographic techniques? That sure. Are so post-quantum so cryptography is in its infancy. They advertise it maybe a little stronger. <laughs> um, but yes, we're looking at ways to do cryptography using qubits. So a lot of things are coming out of this. One thing you can do today is quantum generated keys where you take a quantum computer, you run a bunch of calculations on it, you know, a million times and build an entropy database. And then you get these quantum generated keys, which are actually like the first step towards protecting things from quantum. So, so the Web3 community, right, is trying to use cryptography as the basis for building a world of digital assets. You know, so brave. Uh, uh, for, you know, your ownership in a company, your ownership in a piece of art, your, your you know, your, your digital identity documents, right? If, if there's kind of this, this like, shifting sand under our feet, um, what, what do you think that the Web3 community should then be thinking about to get ahead of the curve or get ahead of waking up one morning to discover that, they can't Absolutely. make those promises anymore. A Absolutely. I, look, I think it's really, really simple, and I plan on helping the Web3 community. We have a domain, quantum.org, and the plan is sometime later this year, early next year, to start publishing resources around these kind of topics that are the most asked questions, but also with data, like here's the latest report where somebody proved that you could break something with this many qubits, and then also the data of here's a computer and how far away it is from that, and, and kind of predicting it. But you have to be watching quantum computing today, because I, I mean, it's easy for somebody who's doing it as their whole life to say that, but I could have worked in anything I wanted and thought about Web3 too, right? Like this is fascinating. I picked quantum, because it's gonna change computing more by the end of this decade than it's changed in its entire existence. It's not about better drug discovery, it's about literally eradicating disease. It's not about better battery technology, it's about completely new forms of energy. It's about, think of the year 2023 being 1963, when Jack Kilby had pretty much perfected the integrated circuit he made in the, in the late 50s, and it was like, whoa, there's gonna be all these computers and all this stuff. Nobody thought of Web3, nobody thought of the internet, nobody thought of crypto or autonomous vehicles or AI or a lot of these things in the way that we have them today. That is the kind of fundamental paradigm shift we're about to go well, through with quantum computing. Let me, let me uh, then throw this back a little bit, which is you know, the beginning of the computing era was all about mainframes and mini computers, and it wasn't until like 30 years into it that we had the personal computer. Um, most people still don't have quantum hardware under their desk or on their laptop or whatever. What's right. the, how long until there's like consumer hardware that has some quantum circuitry or is able to do like what you're talking about, which is quantum encryption at the local level? Yeah, the, the truthful answer is, um, you know, the only consumerish type hardware you have are like random number generators that are quantum created, things like that. Um, these machines are big. And when you're taking something like a salt atom, blowing it up, pulling electron off and freezing it down in cold space, that... Uh, has a, a decoherence time, right? So you freeze those down and you, you stop them from moving and you can use all of your rotations to set them. Not a lot of consumer hardware that has to keep they, things they, right, they, Kelvin, right, so. right, so I'd say that's a stretch, but how will it affect consumers? Um, your um, text that you're texting when it gives you autocorrect, that will be affected. Uh, search, Google is invested for reasons. If I had, say, you know, your phone number but not your name, and I want to find you in a phone book, a classical computer goes line by line by line. A quantum computer only needs the square root of the number of entries to get to the same answer, right? So, so, so it will affect you and your parents and everybody and definitely Web3, but not directly. Like you won't probably buy quantum hardware in the next 20 years. So put aside from quantum, and aside from the quantum effect it'll have in this space, what is kind of your take as somebody who's like adjacent to the, the, the crypto space and, and like the broader blockchain kind of space, perhaps even, you know, like inclusive of Filecoin and IPFS? Like, what's your, your take on this I, and the moment that we're in right I'm now? Gonna, I'm going to be super honest and you can feel free to boo or throw stuff at me. Um, but I have been waiting for the moment we're in right now. 
I think there's a lot of overhype. I think there's a lot of fraud. There's a lot of things that none of you are doing, none of you want to be a part of, but whenever you have a new technological movement, those people come out of the woodwork. And I think the downturn and where we're at right now is a very healthy thing for Web3 because it's going to flush a lot of those people out of the system, and then there's going to be things that come in that are going to start shoring up the problems that we've had. So now it becomes something that can be adopted on a much more mass level. And I say that because, look, Everybody has their industry. I could tell you about all the people I know in quantum and my LinkedIn and Twitter feeds are just quantum, quantum, quantum. And if you view the world that way, you don't realize, like, like I said, still today, if all of us went out of business tonight, probably nobody would care, right? Web3 is in the news. It's got that. But still, it has a long, long way to go. And you're gonna have, you're gonna go, it's going to go through three or four downturns. But this is, to me, the first real major one. And I'm hoping that it flushes a lot of the, the, the crap out of the system so we can focus on the real core stuff that makes Web3 so amazing and wonderful and why we all want to see it become a reality. Well, that's a perfect thing to end on, then. Thank you so much, Royal. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. See you soon.